Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to the first uh, talk to the Groundwater Division of the Western Cape. Um, today, we have Helen Saylor, who many of you have probably worked with, or like many students and myself, we've probably read some of the work that she's done. Um, today, she'll be talking to us about machine learning, modeling techniques for groundwater availability. Uh, just a bit of background for those who don't know Helen. She has about 13 years of experience as a hydrogeologist in South Africa, including uh, experience in various aspects of groundwater research management and specializing in numerical modeling for water resource quantification and scenario planning well field operation rules, surface water groundwater interaction, and the groundwater aspects for mining EIAs. She has a particular interest in sustainable groundwater use and in social and economic development challenges as they relate to resource management. She's currently busy with her PhD thesis um, entitled Groundwater Decision Support Systems, including sustainability indicators for sustainable groundwater use. Um, thank you so much, Helen, for availing yourself for today. Um, I'm going to hand over to you now. Great, thank you for the introduction, Samaya. And yeah, welcome to everybody else. I have to say it is rather strange. I know I saw the attendance list. I know there's uh, many of you listening and yeah, just to say thank you for putting the time in. Um, I've hidden self-view and I've hidden all the uh, meeting controls so that you can just see the presentation more clearly. So um, it really is strange to feel like I'm talking into an empty room, but um, yeah, so, so that is the, the way of the world at the moment. So thank you for listening. Um, so uh, this talk actually comes out of, sorry, I'm pressing down and nothing's happening for the next slide. There we go. Um, the talk I'm giving comes from a, sorry, let me find my pointer and then we're ready to go. There we go. The talk comes from a Water Research Commission project um, that we are just finishing now. The final report's just been submitted to the WRC. Um, and so it should be available soon in the coming few months. And the authors are listed here and Kirsty and Yolanda did a lot of the modeling work and they're on the call as well. So um, hopefully can help out if there's any technical questions. And um, I wanted to include this up front. It's often at the end, the acknowledgements, but it's just to say it really was a team effort. We um, expanded the team as we went and we got more and more stuck with the machine learning models. Um, particularly Stefan and Max uh, from BGR in Germany were, were really helpful to us and Professor, Professor Judah at the University of Bits was also really helpful to us. And it was um, the, the project, although it was uh, the client, main client was the Water Research Commission, it was actually funded through um, by a consortium, USAID and the Department of Science and Technology, and also the SADAC GMI. Um, and that funding was managed through the WRC and the Sustainable Water Partnership also helped um, administer the project and IBM and the USGS were supporting partners. And that collaboration came together um, uh, in 2017, they set up this funding mechanism. And the main aim of this collaboration was to basically experiment on the use of big data analytics and machine learning in groundwater science, basically to see if, uh, if new approaches new approaches for big data analytics could improve our decision making. And the particular interest was in transboundary groundwater management for the purpose of increasing water security. That was their fundamental aim. Um, and it really was, you know, the word experiment is in bold. It was an experiment. I think a lot of the time these, um, sometimes we do water research commission projects where we know what method we're going to apply um, and we come out with a particular outcome. We were really encouraged in these these projects to to test to see what would happen and you know even a, a result of no this doesn't work was a useful was seen as a useful research outcome and our project was actually one of four so that funding mechanism um, the collaboration came up with four particular projects that they wanted to look at and so it was four parallel projects put out by the WRC at the same time we were theme four um, groundwater secure transboundary systems but there were three other themes um, uh, one 
completed by Mvoto, one uh, done by the University of Witz and one by the University of the Western Cape. And I just mentioned those so that you know that what I'm presenting here today is one part of our project and our project was one part of four parallel projects which are part of a much larger collaboration looking at big data analytics and machine learning. And I also include this slide just to kind of say watch this space, you know, that um, the reports from all of these projects will be coming out in the next uh, few months or so and I think there's some really interesting insights there for us. Okay, so leaping into um, what I'm going to talk about. First, uh, I'm going to give a bit of a background on uh, the definitions for sustainable groundwater use and how we define groundwater availability and how we estimate the impacts of abstraction and it's those impacts that dictate groundwater availability and we need to understand that in order to understand the particular problem that we were trying to solve with machine learning models um, and then looking at the modeling itself we'll go through the test sites and then look at the how the models were set up and the results and then look at based on those results what does it imply for how we could use machine learning models in groundwater science uh, so i'm sure many of you have seen this slide from me many times before i've used it uh, i think at conferences i realized for the last eight years or so and it's just such an important slide and so useful to explain um, the concept of groundwater availability so on the left we've got a very simplified uh, aquifer sh just shown as a box we've got recharge coming in, we've got discharge leaving the aquifer and a groundwater level is established and this aquifer shown on the left is in its natural state and in its natural state, so there's no pumping happening, in its natural state it's in a, an equilibrium, discharge equals recharge, so there might be wet and dry years but over the long term that groundwater level isn't going to change and on the right we've started pumping in this aquifer and as we know, pumping induces a loss from storage. So groundwater levels decline when we pump. And then over time, known as the response time, this aquifer will, will reach a new equilibrium where there's no further loss from storage. And so the abstracted water with the, shown with the red arrow is met by reduced discharge. This little arrow has reduced in size here and or enhanced recharge. This has increased here. And we can say that the pumping has captured these sources. And an important concept is that if these sources can meet the abstraction rate and if a new dynamic equilibrium can be formed, then this abstraction rate can be maintained indefinitely. So we can keep pumping at this rate forever and groundwater levels won't continue to decline if we can capture these sources. And just showing that same concept with another example, this is a simplified, um, a simplified aquifer. It's an island sitting with a lake around it. It's an alluvial aquifer. And under natural conditions in this first image, we have recharge from rainfall and we have discharge into the lake. And when the aquifer is pumped at a low rate, the pumped water is met by reducing this discharge to the lake. And this image is shown at the new equilibrium. And so there has been a loss from storage. This is what the stabilized groundwater level looks like. And if we increase the pump rate in the bottom image um, beyond the pre-pumped discharge rate, then what's going to happen is the hydraulic gradient to the lake is reversed and now pumped water is being sourced by enhanced recharge. So the total water pumped out is met by the original discharge rate plus what we can enhance by pulling lake water into the aquifer and the groundwater level has declined. So both of these pump rates, the middle one and the bottom one, are maintainable yields. They can be maintained over the long term from these sources. And the in, important concept is that the impact of the abstraction on the groundwater levels and on the aquifer fluxes is related to the abstraction rate. So there's a relationship here between how much we're pumping and how much flows out of the aquifer. And that concept is the same for one borehole shown in this image or for hundreds of boreholes across the aquifer. And those previous two examples were shown at the new dynamic equilibrium, so time independent, at a future steady state. And this just shows the same concept over time. Um, so these are groundwater levels from uh, a well field from the West Coast District Municipality well field on the West Coast at the Langerbarn Road. Um, and the graph starts in 1998 and goes on till 2005. And if we just look at the red and the green line from two pumped boreholes, we see that in 1999, when abstraction starts, between 1999 and around about 2001 here, 
there's the greatest change in groundwater level. So after around this time, there's a very insignificant change in the groundwater levels. Yet since the start, since 1999, we're pumping more or less the same amount, which is shown in those gray bars. So there's certainly some months with pumping a lot less and some months with more. But if you take the laser pointer as the kind of average abstraction rate, we're pumping the same amount continually yet there's no further loss from storage because initially the abstracted water in those first few years is derived from storage. And in these last few years here, there's no further loss from storage and the abstracted water is coming from reduced discharge and or enhanced recharge. So those slides just illustrate what happens when we pump and the source of abstracted water. And what we need to do to establish to, or to understand an aquifer yield and decide what we're going to pump in future. Let's say we are in, in an area where we wanted to develop an aquifer. We need to be able to say, okay, if we pump 10 million cubic meters a year, the reduction in discharge is going to be a certain amount. The um, enhanced recharge will happen or won't happen. And it's really uh, our role as hydrogeologists to come up with that relationship between yield and impacts. And then it's the regulator's um, role to decide what's acceptable or not with stakeholders. And if a maintainable yield is acceptable, it can be considered sustainable. So that's the background. And that's what we spend a lot of time doing when we're trying to um, look at groundwater assessments is generating a graph like this to come up with the, the relationship between abstraction shown on the x-axis here, increasing abstraction and the aquifer fluxes shown on the y-axis. So we would need to know this relationship shown by this graph and also the equivalent change in groundwater levels. So this graph is also from the same case study, the West uh, West Coast area, the Langevin Road aquifer uh, well field. So with zero abstraction here, the natural discharge, here we go, discharge to the ocean would be 15 million cubic meters a year. And as we go along the x-axis and the abstraction rate increases, discharge to the ocean is reducing, it's coming closer to zero. And this result, this, this graph is something we generate with numerical models each. Um, it, yeah, we're running the numerical model to dynamic equilibrium as in a steady state model with varying increasing abstraction rates to produce these modeled fluxes at each abstraction rate. So we rely on numerical models to provide that graph and that graph is what we need to determine groundwater availability. It's also what we need for um, things like the impact of mining and, and major abstraction. So we rely on numerical models to generate that graph, to evaluate and qualify, quantify the impacts of abstraction. Because of the complexity of groundwater systems, we can't, we can't come up with that graph and those impacts generally using analytical equations for any real system um, because of the 3D nature of groundwater. Um, we can only really use analytical equations for the simplest of situations like pumping in one borehole, which is what we do, of course, with pump test analysis. So, um, and because of this and because numerical groundwater models require quite a lot of data and time and effort and also expertise, um, there's been a lot of research looking at whether we could use these data-driven or machine learning methods to predict groundwater level change. The advantage being that they don't require a deep knowledge of the underlying physical parameters so for numerical models, we need to know the hydraulic conductivity or that's our um, calibration parameter. We also need to really understand the conceptual model. So even if we have a lot of groundwater level data, we might not really understand uh, the flow regime in the aquifer. And that's, that's something that's difficult for us to uh, pepper the aquifer with in enough boreholes that we can really define the physical parameters and the conceptual model. Now, machine learning methods and uh, they, they essentially run on pattern recognition only. So if we have a pattern between rainfall and groundwater level, the machine learning model would simply learn that pattern and then be able to replicate the groundwater levels. And so they don't need to know all these underlying physical parameters and how the aquifer works. So there is a lot of research out there that looks at exactly that, looks at replicating groundwater levels based on changing climate and rainfall what we wanted to do in this research was kind of take that a little step further and say, well, could we, rather than just looking at this pattern between rainfall and groundwater level, could we actually predict 
forward for groundwater stresses such as recharge and abstraction could we predict the groundwater level into the future when changing those stresses in the same way that we do for using numerical models in order to understand groundwater availability so we wanted to look at how far forward could we predict and would, would that is that something that the models would be able to do um, and we also wanted to look at whether we could predict, predict aquifer fluxes like discharge um, based on for example a minimum groundwater level um, I, I was chatting to Samaya at the start and we thought it would be nice to, rather than have all the questions at the end, sorry, I should have said this at the start, um, you're welcome to interrupt. Um, so it's kind of a good time to pause now uh, if there's any questions so far, or we can also address them all at the end. So I can pause now and then again during the models to see if there's any questions, any questions. And I can't see the chat box, so Samaya, just let me know if I need to, if I can keep going or we can chat. Uh, there aren't any questions yet, Helen. Um, sure. Feel free to type your questions in the chat box should you have any from Helen, and I'll we can pause to address okay. that. Great, thanks. Okay, so hopefully that means what we were trying to do is 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 um, obvious to everyone. Um, so our case study sites. I said that this was one of four projects under the collaboration, and that they wanted to look at testing big data analytics particularly for transboundary systems. So the other projects under this umbrella uh, used the Ramotswa transboundary aquifer between Botswana and South Africa as a test site. We, um, we, we tried to do the same and essentially found that we didn't have enough data to train machine learning models if we used the Ramotswa aquifer. We needed an area where we had really high density data. And we also needed an area where there was high groundwater use so that the impacts of that use were, was, were potentially detectable in the data sets. Because I said to come up with that graph, which showed you know, increasing abstraction and impacts on discharge and things like that, the machine learning model isn't going to be able to predict any of that unless it sees some of that in its training data. So we needed to have uh, test sites where there were already impacts of abstraction. So we went, we moved away from Ramotswa into the South African Dolomites and we used Fontaine and Steen copies shown here, um, where there are a huge number of boreholes abstracting groundwater because they're significant aquifers. So we had uh, basically the maximum amount of data that you could get in this country from those two sites. And the variables used for the models was weather data, groundwater use data and groundwater discharge. And I'll just show an example of some of that data. So this is just um, one borehole. Uh, in, shown in the green line. We used rainfall data from the nearest weather stations for the two test sites that's shown in blue here, monthly weather day, monthly rainfall data. And we used the discharge data, of course, because we're trying to trying to use the models to predict the impact of abstraction or something or changing variables on aquifer fluxes. So we need a data set for that aquifer flux being discharged from the aquifer. So both those two compartments discharge to groundwater fed springs. So we used the spring discharge rate. And you can see when we look at the data that we do have a correlation or a pattern that we can see between the groundwater level uh, in green and the discharge, of course, because groundwater level change is driving the discharge and between rainfall. And um, of course, as, as you imagine, when we have peaks in rainfall, they correlate to peaks in groundwater level there and peaks in the discharge rate. Uh, we did see, of course, as we'd expect for the Dolomites, a slightly lagged response to rainfall, which we can we can we analyzed, we quantified, and uh, used as an input variable for the machine learning model. And we also see that um, it's only really rainfall above 100 millimeters per month that caused recharge, which we'd also expect. But because of this last factor actually meant that the initial models didn't see a correlation between groundwater level and rainfall at all, because the rainfall signature was too noisy. There were so many um, data points that weren't causing an impact on groundwater level. So we actually ended up having to model with the rainfall trend as the input, not the raw rainfall data. Um, I yeah. have a, a question, Helen. Yeah. Um, in terms of your, your timeline, um, yes. was there a period that you would consider a minimum period over which to um, use in your model, like 10 years, 20 years? Um, was there something like that? Or? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and it might become um, clear a little bit later. So 
the models are basically better the larger number of data points you give it. So it doesn't really relate directly to number of years. So for example, if we had these boreholes measuring hourly groundwater level, um, we could use only a couple of years because those couple of years would be thousands of data points. But because we wanted to look at the long-term impacts, you know, we, we're looking at, we're trying to model phenomenon that happen over the aquifer response time. You know, this background decline in groundwater level response in response to sustained abstraction is something that happens over 20, 30 years. We therefore needed very long-term groundwater level and therefore we needed to rely on the Hydstra database from the department, which has monthly data only. And because we have monthly data, we only have at maximum 12 per year. And in order to then get enough data that the models could recognize the patterns, we struggled with boreholes that had any less than, so for example, 10 years worth of data. Um, so we needed to use the boreholes that had 30 years worth of data because 30 times 12 was enough data points for the machine learning models to pick up the patterns. Um, we have another question. Um, yeah. Is the licensed abstraction data from the same area? Yes, so that's what I was getting onto next with this slide. I just hadn't yet mentioned the license, the, the groundwater use data that we used. Now, because we wanted to, we weren't trying to predict the groundwater level response in one borehole to pumping in that borehole, we were trying to replicate phenomena that were happening across the aquifer. We wanted to use and, and coming, you know, referring back to that graph of increasing abstraction rate and impacts on the aquifer fluxes, that's abstraction across the whole aquifer. So this gray line here is the summed abstraction from the WARMS database for the whole aquifer, um, which is why it's quite a step, why, quite, a, quite a flat graph as well, because the licensed start date from the WARMS database is very un inaccurate. Um, so we had to make many assumptions and it came out as this you know, stepwise graph rather than maybe a gradually increasing, a graph showing gradually increasing groundwater abstraction rates. And, it, and yeah, in response to that question, it is from the same compartment. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, can I carry on? Sure, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so that's the input data for the model. And just coming back again, sorry, to that groundwater use data set that we had. This was even before we started modeling, what we thought would be the biggest test of these models is because you can't really see by eye any real correlation between a groundwater abstraction rate that simply starts and is sustained and the groundwater level decline. We all know as hydrogeologists that we start pumping, groundwater levels are going to decline, but there's no recurring pattern there between those two data sets that a model could pick up on. So that was our real test, and, and the model would have to be able to pick up on that pattern or that that influence of the two in order to produce this graph of impacts on groundwater fluxes over increasing abstraction rate so that was really the test to the to the to the model as you can see in this graph we've got this um flat groundwater abstraction rate that kind of increases over time and we want to be able to see whether that can be um can influence the modeled groundwater level Okay, so um, this is looking at the type of model that we used. Um, lots of different types of machine learning models. We used artificial neural networks for this exercise. And these essentially have an input layer, meaning the, the database, the data that you input, a hidden layer, which is kind of, you can think of it as a, as a black box model that does the number crunching, that does the pattern recognition, and then it outputs uh, a predicted result. And there's two types, the feed forward neural network and the recurrent neural network. Now, feed forward, an example of that would be uh, just the alphabet. If we have an A to Z sequence and there's a pattern in that, as in we know which, uh, which order those letters go in, you would, the, the hidden layer, you would tell it an S and the hidden layer would have learned that sequence and just be able to say, well, the result is T. Um, a recurrent neural network doesn't just look at the previous or that, that current information that you're giving it, a recurrent neural network is able to kind of look further back. It's able to look at a trend um, or, you know, 10 previous input, input data sets. 
So recurrent neural networks we use for anything where there's a natural trend in the data, which is of course what we have in groundwater level. The groundwater level tomorrow doesn't just depend on what it is today, it depends on the previous week, months, years. Um, so recurrent, yeah, look further backwards and take that and, and feed it back into the model. And we used, we tested two different recurrent neural network models, the long short term memory LSTM and the NAR model, neural network auto regression model. And I'm not going to go into too much technical detail just because of the audience that we are. Um, and the difference between the two basically is the way in which that hidden layer stores the previous timestamps, whether it's in a hidden, lay, lay, hidden state, as in the LSTM, or whether it uh, brings it back out of the hidden state and inputs it as an input variable. And so we tested these two, the LSTM in Crotefontaine and the NAR model in Steam copies. And I'm actually not going to go through the hidden layer in the model, how the model works in great detail. There is a lot of technical detail in the reports. I'm just showing this to show, uh, you know, the steps involved in the machine learning models. So those are the input variables that I mentioned already, weather and spring discharge and groundwater use. And those are the input variables and the target variable. What you're trying to predict is the groundwater level. Those two together make our data set. Within the modeling process there's something called hyperparameter tuning which we can kind of think is a little bit like the calibration parameters in a numerical model um, and there's something called cross-validation that we do to minimize the impact of overfitting and we have to optimize these parameters but what we what we do also a little bit like numerical modeling where we have a calibration here we have what we call a training data set where the model sees what it's trying to predict so in the training it sees all of those input variables and it tries to predict the target variable, the groundwater level, but it sees it so it can change, it can, it can get better at predicting that by checking it against the target variable. So you give you, we used 80% of the data for training and 20% for testing. So then in the testing, the model doesn't see what it's trying to predict and you see how well it fares against the actual observed. And just like in numerical modeling, we use the same um, uh, metrics to see how well the model has performed, the root mean square, the mean square error and the R squared for, and, and those metrics. Um, I've already talked about that. Okay, so here are the results from the uh, training and testing period for the NAR model. And I'm just showing here uh, four boreholes just to show a range of the results. So as I said, we used the longest all the data that was available for the hydra monitoring boreholes across the two compartments and the gray is the observed and the red is the modeled training data set and so you can see during training as i said because the model can see what it's trying to predict it, it actually predicts it very well um, and then during test there's the test the simulated test result is in blue and the observed in gray so the test is as you'd expect it to be not as good as the valid as the training data set and you can see these models basically did very very well in predicting the groundwater level you can see the only place they didn't do so well is um some of the spikes the troughs and the peaks of groundwater level are not are not matched exactly there's the pointer over one of them it's not getting down to here it's not getting down to here um and again then during the test it's not quite matching these peaks and some of the so these two boreholes on the left did much better during the test period than these two on the right these two on the right were some of the worst ones um, so whilst the pattern is correct here we've got an increase in observed groundwater level here in the gray that is matched in the blue but the magnitude is is falling off on these two here and I've just zoomed in there to show an interesting feature. You can see the observed groundwater level is a flat line there, obviously because we had a data gap that wasn't taken out of that observed um, data set. And of course, because the model is then trying to predict weight based on rainfall and discharge and all the other parameters, we've got a um, what's probably more realistic than the data gap. We, we've basically generated, we've plugged that data gap there with um, modeled data. And just showing the same model, the scenario testing then. So once we had these calibrated trained um, models for each borehole, and some of them fared better, the ones on the left than on the right, we used those models to, uh, to perform some scenario testing. So this shows the base case in the gray and the result of the scenario in the blue. 
Um, so the top one is increasing the rainfall intensity and then the middle is decreasing the rainfall intensity. So we doubled the 100 millimetres per month where there was 100 millimetres in a month that caused a peak. We doubled it, increasing the rainfall intensity. And then in the decreasing, we removed all of those peaks. And you can see that models have kind of got it right in terms of, yeah, OK, we increase rainfall intensity and the magnitude of the modelled groundwater level increases here. Um, in decreasing it, we didn't see a major change for many of the boreholes. And this is the NAR for steen copies. In doubling the abstraction, uh, we didn't see a major change. So, sorry, just going back, the doubling abstraction actually caused the observed, sorry, the, the resulting groundwater level in the test, which is the blue line, to flatten compared to the, um, compared to the base case. So rather than it learning that abstraction is causing a decrease in groundwater levels. In this case, it just, because it was a flat line that increased compared to this curve, it flattened the groundwater levels. We have a question, uh, Helen. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not sure if I'm saying the person's name very clearly. Is it Ari or Ari? Um, would be interested in how you dealt with the sources of errors with your data. How did you deal with the sources of error in your data sets? Yeah, I mean, my, my gut feel is to say we, we didn't explicitly account for errors in the data set. Um, we took out any, any groundwater levels for any boreholes that were obviously wrong. So I showed that example because I'm pleased that we didn't spot that data gap and we kept it in there because it highlighted for me where, um, where the model could plug data gaps. But any groundwater any borehole that had a long stretch of what looked by eye like incorrect data, you know, we all, we all know what it looks like when you suddenly, you know, your ground levels are going along at 20 or 30 below ground and you suddenly get a hundred or, you know, something that doesn't look like a natural uh, response to pumping. We took all of those out um, uh, so that we were modeling, re you know, what we considered real data sets. Um, but there was no explicit accounting for error as you would perhaps in, um, in a numerical model where you would do a stochastic assessment to see, okay, if we've got this wrong, what's the impact on the result? That wasn't our aim here, was to see whether the machine learning models could replicate the data set, assuming the data set was correct. Oh. Thank um, you. Okay. Um, so the other scenarios that we looked at was just to see, could we do longer term predictions? As I said, to get these models working well, we used an 80, 20, train and test data split. Um, so the boreholes had around 30 years of data. So that ended up with, uh, you know, just less than 30 years for training and maybe about five years for testing. We thought, well, what if we wanted to predict? Yeah, five years is, is nothing, is probably, uh, response time is probably much longer than five years. So we thought, well, could we predict for 15 years or more? So on the left is an example of where we, with the same data, just reduced the training data set to 15 years, half of the 30. So we used 50% for training and 50% for testing. And this graph is just in here to demonstrate to you the impact of having a much smaller data set for training. You can see even in training, the observed groundwater level is not very well matched. And because the training isn't very good, the testing is even worse on the right-hand side here. And then the right-hand graph, we used all of the data for training, <coughs> excuse me, so there's 30 years worth of training there, and it's almost exactly matched with the pink line on top of the gray line. Um, so it just demonstrates that should you have enough data to have a really good validation test, and should you have um, a data set showing you what the future is going to look like, which is what we've done here, we've just assumed some future rainfall pattern and groundwater use, then yes, of course, you could predict for any distance into the future, but you have nothing ch to check it against. This is just demonstrating that it would be possible in theory to use that for um, future predictions. And then um, here is the same, the same graphs for the other model, the LSTM in Crotefontaine. Um, and again, for the training and the test, we see the same kind of thing. We see uh, the patterns are replicated by the model quite well. Uh, again, the peaks and the troughs aren't perfectly matched. Here's a, uh, some peaks that aren't matched with the uh, model data there. But on the whole, we saw the LSTM performing slightly better. And 
certainly better in the scenario testing. So the magnitude of the groundwater levels increases for the increased rainfall and decreases for the decreased rainfall. And doubling the abstraction for the Hrukfontein LSTM model did cause the groundwater levels to reduce. So you can see this is the, um, the model, the scenario test in blue. And so there's been a reduction in the groundwater levels compared to the base case when we double the abstraction for that scenario. And again, uh, this is showing those two tests for um, trying to do a longer term prediction. So the top graph, we reduced the training data set to 15 years so that we could test for 15 years. And this one compared to three slides ago, is much it's a much closer prediction for the future 15 years and we tried to work out how why was that so why was this one performing so much better and in this case and in this particular individual borehole um the groundwater levels were much more closely correlated to the rainfall and the discharge than in the previous test and so although it's got a much reduced training data set that close correlation with discharge and rainfall is managing to keep the prediction kind of on target going, going into the future. Um, okay, so I've only really been able to show a very small portion of the modeling and the testing that we did, but what I wanted to go through in more detail is kind of the insights that we gained in doing all that testing and people can go and have a look at the report to, to look at all the modeling in greater detail. So just to summarize, the models did demonstrate a reliable performance in forecasting groundwater levels in cases where the training data set was representative of the test data set. Oh, I didn't say that earlier, but in those where the peaks and troughs were not well replicated, that was generally more so when there were less peaks and troughs in training. So if the training data set fluctuated a lot and then we had one or two fluctuations in test, it would be better at predicting those fluctuations if it had had a lot to go on during training. Um, and we also saw it was a reliable outcome if the input variable represents the target closely. So it was that last example saying, because it matched well in that case with rainfall and discharge, the modeled groundwater level matched much better. But the implication of that is what would we do in situations where there isn't a target data where there isn't sorry input data that matches groundwater level closely where you know in the dolomites we have discharge and rainfall correlating closely to groundwater level we wouldn't have the same in a confined aquifer or in you know in the Karoo or in areas where there's episodic recharge we'd have groundwater levels that are pretty stable and don't correlate strongly with those other factors so um, there's questions of whether you could use this kind of modeling there um, and we also had reliable performance where there was sufficient data. You know, we had, as I was saying at the start, we had to have um, hundreds of data points to run these models, not just 12, you know, a year's worth of data. And that's why we weren't able to use Ramotswa. Um, there were, you know, the maximum number of data points for one borehole was something like 50, which may have been, I don't know, a few years of 12 months worth of, you know, of monthly data. And that wasn't enough to train the models. Um, and, and then thinking about how did the models fare when we, you know, the, the key aim was to look at whether we could model these aquifer fluxes rather than just looking at groundwater level changes. Um, and the, the key message takeaway is basically that machine learning models can predict anything if there's a decent pattern for it, if there's a pattern for it that is captured well in the data. But we saw that the NAR model for steam copies was unable to pick up that pattern between groundwater use and groundwater levels. Um, we also know that we wanted to use the models to predict groundwater discharge. And if you want to do that, you're going to have to have a data set for discharge. And that's rare for groundwater. We often don't have spring discharge data or we don't know where the aquifer is even discharging. We don't know which springs are connected, let alone have data for those springs. We would also have a problem um, translating between the borehole scale and the aquifer scale if we were trying to quantify storage impacts you know going back to that graph of increasing abstraction and fluxes on the y-axis if we had um you know the the impact between increasing abstraction and storage across the aquifer we'd have to have lots of borehole points um lots of machine learning models per borehole and be able to then interpolate across the whole area to come up with storage impacts um, so there's a scale issue there. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the next one. Yeah, the, and the other 
shortcoming really that we've come across that we think I think is the biggest game changer. Although I showed that the Hrodfontein model, the LSTM, was able to generate a, uh, a reduced groundwater level for increased abstraction, the model has nothing to go on to generate the magnitude of that change. And we have, I have zero confidence, to be honest with you all, in, um, in the magnitude of that change because the model hasn't been trained on uh, a, a data set showing at dynamic equilibrium for this abstraction rate, this is the impact on groundwater levels, this abstraction rate, this is the impact on groundwater levels, because we don't, we haven't done that yet. We're trying to use these models. We were trying to use the models for predicting something that hasn't been seen in the data set, which is what we try to do with numerical models as well, but they then have the physical process mathematics behind to predict what the, to quantify what that impact would be. And machine learning models don't, they're not set up for that. They're only going to, to predict something it has a pattern for. Now that conclusion, of course, we could have said right up front, um, but we, and anybody who's a computer scientist who understands how computer models work um, would know that it needs the pattern recognition, but we all felt it was still worthwhile testing whether this um, sustained abstraction rate could generate an impact on the groundwater levels or not in the models. Um, so we basically think not really um, that for that kind of assessment, we would really need to stick to numerical modeling. Um, but it's not all bad news. Uh, what we've done has shown that there, yeah, we've kind of confirmed what's well established in the research, you know, contributes to that, that base research showing that yes, we can predict groundwater level response to short term climate variability. And yes, there may be other applications that machine learning models could help with, such as well field optimization or causation, kind of proving the um, impact of one variable on another. Uh, and uh, we would recommend that machine learning models would be excellent for patching data gaps. I have a dream of taking the hydrogen data set off the department and giving it back with all the data gaps patched um, so that we can uh, have a complete record for numerical modeling or other implications because, um, yeah, that is something that would be possible where the groundwater level responds well to rainfall, for example. Um, and there are situations where machine learning models could be used as an alternative and should be considered as an alternative to other models if those criteria for success that were on the previous slide are met. Um, and for example, I have a, I was chatting to a friend, colleague uh, uh, last week who um, works in alien vegetation clearing and she's monitoring stream flow in a catchment where they have all the other data as well. They've got rainfall data, a weather station there and stream flow. And they, made, they monitored before uh, clearing the alien vegetation and after, and they've been asked to quantify the impact of uh, the alien vegetation clearing. And that's something that the machine learning models could be um, excellent for because they would be able to match the stream flow before clearing because they've got all the other parameters. And then that machine using that same model for afterwards, there would be a, the model would be able to predict what the stream flow should be now had the conditions stayed the same, but the conditions haven't stayed the same. So the difference between the modeled and the observed currently would be the impact of alien vegetation clearing. So once you've gone through this process and you understand what the machine learning models can do and can't do, when you're looking at situations, you'd be able to know, okay, this is a, a situation in which I could use machine learning models or not. Okay, and with that, I've got through to the end of the um, slide. So yeah, it'd be great to hear feedback and anyone's questions. We have a few, two questions for now. Um, one from Sonia Feldman. Would you be able to overcome the storage effects with training the models with results from, i.e., two layered numerical models, uh, where at first you calibrate the groundwater system through the numerical model and then use um, those time data sets to train the, the, your um, neural networks or your models? I think that's what the question. Yeah, yeah I'm trying to actually. I, I did get the question. I'm trying to bring up the chat so that I can actually read it slowly as well. Um, yeah, definitely, Sonia. I wonder whether you've had some experience in this. You can unmute yourself, and we can. It would be great to hear your, yeah. your input. Um, do we want to do that? Can uh, yeah, I know. I was just going to say because that's where the research is question. going now. Is yeah. is looking at combining the numerical models with the machine learning models. Um, 
uh, Sonia Feldman, you want to unmute and maybe clarify your question? Hi, Anand, can you hear me? Hi, yeah, Sonia, how are you? <laughs> Good, thank you. Thank you for putting me on the spot. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> No, we tried. We 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 had a look at the ANNs um, 2007 2008 when I was yeah. still working with planning uh, yeah. for specifically using it in uh, licensing, um, making decisions on uh, especially future abstractions from the aquifers. And um, th this was typically the the problems that we got um, when we started training the data sets. So uh, we didn't finish it, um, mm. but we. We're thinking along um, having, you know, um, how do you say, it? normalizing, not normalizing, but averaging out the errors. Mm. In an American model, it's easier because um, you've got, uh, you know, that you, you know, if there's something that doesn't look right, there's probably a, a reason for it. And at the end of the day, you get an, uh, a result from the, the numerical model that is as close as you can get it to the actual data set. Mm. And that would take, um, that would take care of that um question about is the is the neural network seeing something that it cannot understand or it, that doesn't have a good reason for it to be that way so but we didn't get to actually finish that um before i left mm. before i left the department so we were still busy with that so that's just what i was wondering about because typically in the dolomites you'll have the biggest storage at the at the top and you'll have less storage at the bottom and um, if you can do that in a in a, in a two-layer uh, model you generate your flows um, and it makes sense and you've got the two layers if you, if, you, if you can train that neural network to take that change into into consideration as well i think that would i thought at the, that stage i thought that would work um I, i'd be interested to see if if that's actually what will happen <laughs> mm. yeah yeah, I'd also be super interested. I think there's so many applications. Um, and when we were finishing the research, as always with these things, we had so many other ideas of, okay, we could try this, we could try that. And, and at some point you have to um, finish off what you're doing. And I think there's a huge scope for, yeah, marrying the two, using the machine learning models to help you calibrate and help you help you get those machine, those numerical models even better. And did you write up this work, Sonia? Um, some of it, I've got no idea where it is at the moment. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it'd be great to see it. I'll have a look and then see. Mm. That was twelve years ago, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Um, we have another. It's either question or comment, but it relates closely to what you just said about combining machine learning and numerical models to explain um, a situation in your aquifer systems. Um, yeah, how about combining both is, is the question. Combining both machine learning and numerical models um, yeah. for a particular area. Mm. Um, thanks, Maya. I've actually managed to get the chat up in front of so I can, oh, I can see good. the question as well. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I can't. I mean, I haven't. I'm not up to speed with the current research on combining them. I just know that it, there is a lot of scope there. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody else wants to share if they've looked into those re the research on combining the two. Yeah. Do we have any further questions or comments for Helen? I think you've addressed the question in your response to Sonia. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Now, if there aren't any further questions, um, then let's give it a moment. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed your presentation, Helen. Very interesting, uh, very insightful. Great. Um, yeah, I think that holds lots of promise uh, in future research uh, for mm. countrywide, I guess. Mm. Um, if there aren't any further questions, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, I yeah, you're welcome. Your talk. Um, yeah, I hope uh, that we can have 
some of the other participants in your bigger project also present to us at some point? I, yeah, I think that's a great idea. That's why also why I put that slide in up front. I don't <laughs> know if Andrew and Andrew Gemmel of Mboto and Kevin Peterson of UWT and uh, Shlanganani Tutu of Vitz, yeah, the four, the four, the four of us and the four projects um, did work in parallel and shared ideas and. Um, uh, yeah, so they've also got really interesting outputs, all three projects, so it'd be great to hear from them. We'll definitely try and track down uh, Kevin Peterson, so you can share with us what, what he's uh, part of the project has found. Yeah. Yeah. The Western Cape, and also in Vota in the Western Cape, yeah. Oh, someone is asking, Amy Allright is asking, could you please give some brief detail on how you actually Amy. performed the machine learning? platforms code etc yeah sure um amy hi there all that's in the in the report if yolanda and kirsty are still listening i can't see the participants they can tell you which code it was because it was all public source downloaded from the internet our co our platform i can't remember the names of all the software kirsty and yolanda are you out there I don't hear them, so I could actually try and answer the question for you by find, by opening the report. Okay. Um. There she's actually there. said that she'll she's happy to look at the report um, okay sure yeah but if you want to you we have a few moments still uh, okay sure i'm just trying to drop it into the i've replied to kez by mistake okay reply to everyone <laughs> there's, the, <laughs> there's the references um for the lstm i can find the references for Kurt Fontaine as well if you're interested okay maybe share with everyone mm. um, so then people can go and have a look. Yeah, okay. I've just dropped them in there. We can maybe ask Ilanda to share in case uh, people didn't get it um, mm. via email. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, mm. And I wish you all well for, for the rest of 2021. <laughs> Great. We can end our session. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Bye, everyone.